Here's to all the people who do all the work but never get recognized. You never grab no headlines. Your name is never memorized. I'll remember you. Put you in my heart, keep you close to me, and I'll sing this song for you, and I'll tell the world the part that you played in our history. It's hard work, sometimes dirty, usually dangerous, always critical. From the time people began wiring communities with electricity, installing plumbing, lighting and heating their homes with natural gas, utility workers have been on the job. Part of the great industrialization of North America, we worked side by side with millions of men and women building our country, our society. Back then, it was work that depended on the whims of our employers. A worker didn't question a work assignment, he accepted it. He didn't complain about an unsafe condition. He tried to avoid it. He didn't demand a wage increase. He hoped for it. Times were tough. The Great Depression destroyed the lives of millions. And the huge numbers of those out of a job added pressure on workers to toe the boss's line or else. But times changed. Working people demanded their rights. And we had friends in the White House and in Congress. I do not propose to let the people down. Franklin Delano Roosevelt and working people's allies in Congress sponsored new laws to establish the rights of working people to form unions. And we did. In 1938, Philip Murray, vice president of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, part of what is now the AFL-CIO, established the Utility Workers Organizing Committee. It was tough work. The bosses fought against the UWOC. But the early organizers of our union, people like Alan Haywood, Harold Straub, Ed Shedlock, Reggie Brown, Garland Sanders, and Bill Munger, didn't have any quit in them. Soon, local unions were organized all over the country. These dedicated people that lived out of hotels, lived out of barns, lived out of back of their cars, that went all over the country to build this great organization. Then, the world changed once again. A date which will live in infamy. Like millions of young Americans, utility workers answered the call of their country. Many never came back. Those who did had a renewed belief in the promise of America, a vision of our country that would validate what they had been fighting for and they were ready to build a more equitable society in America and take their place in it. If that meant fighting the giant utility companies, well, these men had seen combat. They didn't scare easily. A few fat cat utility executives sure wouldn't do it. During this time, our union matured and grew. On October 31, 1942, the first Constitutional Convention of the Utility Workers Organizing Council was held in Pittsburgh. That convention laid the groundwork for what we know today as the Utility Workers Union of America, forged as an alliance between the Utility Workers Organizing Committee and the Brotherhood of Consolidated Edison Employees. The Utility Workers Union of America came into official being on October 1, 1945. Within a month, the war was over. Soon after that, the Utility Workers Union of America held its first constitutional convention in Atlantic City in April of 1946. Over 300 delegates met to chart the future of our union, and they worked. They elected our first national officers. They developed our constitution. They left us a legacy of strength and democracy we carry forward today. And they challenged the utility workers across America to organize. Throughout the 1950s, that's what we did in California, New York, Ohio, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Wyoming, Michigan. It wasn't easy. It took struggle, both before and after an organizing victory was won. And here's to all the people who stand up and speak for what is right. 
who in the face of fear and intimidation shine like a beacon light. As we organized and grew in the 1950s, our increasing clout gave us the means to improve our lives and our families' lives. The veterans who came home from Korea added more strength and courage to our ranks. We fought to bring equality into the workplace and to bring home more than just a paycheck. Beginning in the late 50s and continuing into the 60s, we started demanding family health care benefits, decent pensions, and improved pay. And as our union entered this new frontier, so did America. Two, there one, the ignition of the burner, zero, ignition, lift off. Lift the off. Vehicle. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream. The passage of critical legislation, like Medicare and civil rights, came through the hard work of unions and working families throughout America. Winning these key social reforms took struggle, and so did winning better contracts in our workplaces. Major strikes occurred across the country in the 60s, in Ohio, Massachusetts, New York, California, and elsewhere. Sometimes it took a while. But in each case, the solidarity of utility workers never wavered. And in each case, our unity prevailed. We were creating better, safer jobs with pay and benefits that meant our families could begin enjoying the fruits of our labor and that we could retire with some measure of security and comfort. But for a new generation of young workers, world events intruded once again. Throughout the years of the Vietnam War, thousands of young men and women served their country, then came home to find work in the utility industry. Like their fathers before them, they were tested by battle and unafraid to stand up for what was right. At the beginning of the 1970s, national wage and price controls put in place by the Nixon administration severely capped pay increases workers could win in collective bargaining contracts. It made negotiating tough. It also meant that we concentrated on winning improvements in health care benefits and pensions. Local unions around the country also negotiated new benefits, like disability insurance, credit unions, and stock purchase plans. Benefits that help secure a more comfortable retirement in addition to pensions. As the 1970s drew to a close, utility workers had every reason to feel optimistic about the future. Our pay and benefits were among the best in North America. Our families were comfortable. For the first time, large numbers of the sons and daughters of utility workers routinely went to college. But all that came crashing down in the 1980s. A new political force arose in the land, one that was turned against working families and our unions. Everybody understands what's going around in the entire country today. Everybody understands that every time you go to the bargaining table today, it's to take something back. Spurred on by the anti-union, anti-worker attitudes of the politicians in Washington and elsewhere in the 1980s, companies came to every negotiating table with a list of takeaways in pay, in benefits, in working conditions. But we fought back. You have the guts to finally stand up and say no more. The box stops here. Then in the 1990s, a new, even more dangerous foe arose, one that we're still fighting today, deregulation. It's part of a bill of goods that Enron and big industrial users are trying to sell us. Their basic premise that a deregulated electric utility system will save consumers money just doesn't wash. The rush to deregulate public utilities and the privatization and contracting out that come with it strikes at the very heart of our union. Deregulation has proved to be nothing more than a scheme for a few huge energy conglomerates to rake in huge profits at the expense of utility workers and average residential ratepayers. The biggest rip-off artist of all? The Enron Corporation. Enron's con game in California demonstrated the depths to which these energy flim-flam artists would sink. But the truth, and the law, caught up to Enron in 2002. It was a house of cards built on greed that came tumbling down in one of the most spectacular corporate crashes in history. 
But for more than five years, while one energy company after another tried to model itself after Enron, the Utility Workers Union was in the forefront of the fight to stop the rush to deregulation. We had been successful in slowing its spread before the fall of Enron. Since then, we've stopped it cold. In states like Arkansas, Montana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Oregon, legislatures that had been considering implementing electricity deregulation have held off. Others, like Arizona, Nevada, and Texas, have revamped their deregulation processes or repealed them altogether. In other states, the effects of deregulation will be felt for years to come. California is still beholden to long-term contracts signed in Enron's heyday. And in the pursuit of even greater profits, utilities across the continent have not invested in infrastructure maintenance or improvements. And they've taken an increasingly adversarial stance at the bargaining table, imposing contracts, prematurely closing plants, and locking out workers. The deregulation era taught us critical lessons about the importance of early and constant political and regulatory intervention. Rising income disparity and an anti-worker political movement demand action. What's this about? Freedom! Right? Locals throughout the country are looking out for members and consumers alike through involvement in rate cases and electing politicians to local, state and federal office who share our values, understand the importance of a strong middle class, and will stand up for the rights of workers to form unions and collectively bargain. It's, it's been a fighting union for forever, and the industry itself has gone through a lot of changes and continues to go through changes. And our folks have always stood up to the fight. Today, America relies on an aging electrical grid, gas pipeline distribution, and water systems, some of which originated in the Civil War. This, combined with the effects of our changing climate, are straining the system and resulting in an increasing number of failures, power interruptions, and floods. The UWUA is on the forefront of innovation to rebuild and repair America. We're partnering with forward-thinking employers and state and local governments to replace aging gas pipelines and rebuild our electric transmission grid, our water and wastewater infrastructure. Now we've had meetings at the White House, we've had meetings with the Department of Energy, Department of Labor. We have made this a priority, this being the need for infrastructure repair. We created the Power for America Training Trust and the Utility Worker Military Assistance Program to attract and train the next generation of utility workers and to retrain our members for emerging utility needs. While we train our members for the future, we work to ensure a just transition for workers and communities impacted by changes in generation to reduce carbon emissions. We are on the move. And as we continue to grow, we're fighting ever harder for our members, our communities, our jobs, and our families. It's a big fight. But then again, utility workers have never turned away from a fight that needed to be taken on. And when we take them on together, we win. Utility Workers Union of America has been in the forefront of fighting for a better America. Better jobs for our members, a better life for our families, a secure retirement. We will continue to fight with the same spirit of solidarity and unity that has brought us to where we are today. We make America work.